What's up? What's up? We got legendary Cam in the house. Man, happy to be here. Thank you for uh, coming to Urban City TV, man. Man, it's urban. It's the city and it's TV. <laughs> we we appreciate it, man. We yeah, know you had shout a shout out to the homie Big Y. That's why I am here. Yes, yes, Big Y. He's definitely helping us on this movement. So we uh, we definitely appreciate and Wacko. Shouts out to Wacko. Yep, yep. Um, so man, let's 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 get into it. Let's just kind of go in and and start and let's talk about you know you as a child and growing up and. Uh, you know, you grew up in the Carver Park yeah. area slash yeah. Watts, yeah. Compton Watts area. Yeah. Why don't we kind of just talk about, you know, you as a child and childhood and growing up in in that area? I actually was was I was born in in East LA, uh, Boyle Heights, um, and from there, um, my moms and pops wasn't they wasn't married yet, so we moved from from LA to um, Inglewood. I actually you spent my first four years, four or five years of my life in in Inglewood family on eighty on eighty uh, third and Seventh Avenue. Yeah. So after they split, you know, they was rocky or whatever, and then they split up. Then I, then um, I moved to or she moved to um, Willowbrook or Compton. Why it's like a little district between Compton and why it's called Willowbrook. Yeah. And that's Carver Park hood. That's like with Martin Luther King Hospital and all that. Um, so that was that plus she she was she was from, my mom rest in peace she was from why she was born on 107th street in uh in central um and then my other half of my family was from great you know my, my cousin lay back and 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 you know they you know half of my family's from grape another part half of the part of the family is from front street watts and you know, I was raised in in Carver Park, 118th Street, coming from Inglewood family. So yeah. it's it's that kind of like yeah, you know yeah. melting pot, that little gumbo pot, you know, of, of my background. So it was it was natural eventually that that would lead to like some peace treaty, gang truce, blood blood and crip, you know, yeah. getting together because all of that was my family anyway. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so you you growing up in the in the Carver Park area, um, you come from a big family, small family. No, nah, big family. Um, my my pops, like I said, since my my pops and moms didn't work out, he winded up having two or three other, you know, baby mamas. So I got brothers and sisters from his side. You know, that's from Inglewood. They all from Inglewood. So. My brothers and sisters from him is mostly from Inglewood because he, he he was a LAPD and then he wound up being a coach at Inglewood High School and all that. So he he was he was coaching um what's my dude name um that played basketball for the Celtics uh, from Inglewood. Oh, uh, Paul Pierce. Paul Pierce. Yeah, yeah he was yeah. Paul Pierce coach. So my little brother Pancho and Paul Pierce and all of them like he used to he used, oh, he used wow. to coach them. Yeah, you know I'm saying. Oh, okay. So he you know. So, but but I wasn't in his in his life. Like we, he wasn't in my life. I wasn't yeah. in his life. So he was he was doing that with, you know, his other families and shit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, my mom's was over here in Carver Park hood. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. we was surviving the way we was surviving or whatever. So, that's that's kind of like how that that started. But at the same time, I knew they existed, and uh -huh. he would come around every blue moon and, and bring my little brother, and we go fishing and this and that. So, based on his. Uh, level of understanding, he, you know, he was trying to do what he was able to do or whatever, but you know, it, it wasn't enough. But um, I knew my brothers and sisters from these, and, and my big brother Sean, Sean and Melissa, um, and and from they was from L.A. So you know, pops was a Rolling Stone, he yeah, was you yeah, know yeah. whatever. So yeah, so that kind of made me hood universal, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So I wasn't just local to one hood, you know what I mean? Because I had brothers from different hoods, Yeah, you know what I mean? Blood brothers. I, I think a lot of people who are from this area, like like me, like, you, you kind of, like, it is like a gumbo pot, because, you, yeah. you, you know, one minute you could be living in Inglewood, next yeah. minute you're down the street in South Central. Yeah, man. Then you're over yeah, in Watch. You, could, man. you go a little bit further, you're in Southgate. So it's kind of like, you know, big, you know. So I, I understand that. Um, so so w were, you, were you influenced by the red rag, the blue rag? I mean, yeah, being the a first carver, gang activity that I ever seen in my life yeah. was when I was on 83rd and 7th Ave. It was Inglewood families, like, 
putting on or, or you know jumping on some little dude coming home from school. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sitting on my front porch and they right across the street. Him, him and this dude up, this little dude, young dude up in the, in the bushes, like where they they beat him into the bushes. You know what I'm saying? So that was my first experience with the whole gang thing. So it was it was blood, the Ingle, Inglewood families, you know, yeah. putting somebody on the hood. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he was coming home from school. He was a nerd, like a little backpack. Like, damn, why they doing him like that? You know what I'm saying? I'm like five years, four or five years old. But you know it was acting. So that was my first my first experience with gang activity was yeah. when I was four or five years old because I don't remember. I, I think five years old was with some Inglewood families putting a little dude on the hood right across from me sitting on my front porch. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't a crip thing. Yeah. My first experience with gang bang wasn't with the crips. It was with Ang- Inglewood family. So so you, you you're growing up in Carver Park area. Yeah. And you know, what what was it like being a teenager in Compton? I'm sure that's gotta be like the mid eighties. Yeah. And that's probably where things were really active back then. And yeah. you know, you hear stories about, you know, the police uh, beating people up, dropping yeah. them off, and other people, you know, other yeah. Uh, yeah. Other, hoods. Uh, other hoods. And uh, I mean, what was it like being, you know, a young man, yeah, you know, young grow, black man, young black man growing up? Because black definitely got everything to do with it. Yeah, because it's it's a white supremacist system. So the police and law enforcement, the the legal, you know, the court system, all of that is racist. All of that's white supremacist racist. So I didn't know that it was like that. I didn't know that's what life was. So my first interaction with, you know, white people like that was with the police, was with law law enforcement. So I'm innocent. I ain't got no track record. I ain't I ain't a bad little dude. I'm a good I'm I'm a mama's son. I'm a good boy, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You're a kid. But the police treated and the sheriffs treated me a different kind of way. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? They treated me like I was Hitler or like I was an enemy, like I was just an evil little demon child. You know, I'm 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 born. I'm a little Christian dude, born in you know, yeah, trying to be be a good boy and obey authority and all of that. That didn't stop them from beating my ass and kicking kicking me in the nuts when I'm 10 years old or 11 years old or you know, roughing me up and treating me like shit. So I already knew at that point, like the difference in this is. These guys are white. These are white policemen. So I already associated at a primitive primary level, I associated white males with the shit that happened to me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I, I didn't know it was racism or whatever, but it wasn't until when I was going to Carver Elementary School. This was in the 70s, and the movie Roots came out. Mm-hmm. Roots came out. Yeah. And that was so revolutionary. That was so epic. Because it came on regular TV, but the day or two or the week after that, everybody, like, unfortunately, we was taking it out on the Mexicans, you know what I'm saying? Because we thought they was white. We didn't even know nothing about, like, if you just was light-skinned and your hair was straight, you was white to us. So we was trying to take retaliation back on what they did to Kunta Kinte. Like, we children and shit, yeah. like, you know what I'm saying? So, but that was, that was, that made sense. That kind of like brought it together for me. Like race, this racism thing, that really exists. This shit really exists. Yeah. And you're a child, you don't know, you you in life, you know, you you, you just got here. You you know, you don't know that this yeah, is what it is. You're innocent child. Yeah, and you see grown up police, like police was like super, he was able like Superman to us. Yeah. You're supposed to look up to them and do what they want and, you know, give them an apple or give them a like, you know, no, they they hate you. Yeah. They hate me. Like, God damn. They hate me. And they 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 violate me. They they physically violate me. They physically abusing me. So then I gotta hurry up in to, on survival mode. Okay, every time I see these people, every time I see that skin, that represents defensive mode. You know what I'm saying? That's the enemy. Yeah. And that's that's how I immediately had to adapt to that reality right there. Getting into the mu- music part. Like how how did you find hip hop? Um, I didn't I didn't find hip hop. Hip hop kind of found me, and of course it started with like Run DMC uh-huh. and, and stuff like that. Cause I always loved music, yeah, you know, but I couldn't sing. I can't carry a note if I tried. So rap represents represented 
a form of music where you didn't have to be able to sing, but you can you can have a bomb beat, you know what I'm saying, something that you that you still rocking with and really, you know able to dance to, but you don't have to be able to be I mean you don't have to be a Mariah Carey or a Michael Jackson and 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 be on tune, be on you know in key and on note and be able to carry tunes and all of that. Yeah. It's you can just talk your talk. So from Run DMC, that started for me, that opened me up to that that genre. And then um Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Melly Mel. That's what really like did it for me. Yeah. Like like I wanna do this because you're telling sh- struggle stories mm-hmm. to some to some bomb music and we can do it over samples like uh um um Sugar Hill Gang, good time. Dun, dun. And then, you know, that was that was a song I knew, but he was do- they was doing a rap over it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I, to me that's what kind of blew the blew the top off of it and, and and made it was love at first sight for me or love at first listen where okay here's music it's our kind of music kind of music we pop liking to or dancing to or or breaking to and you don't have to sing you don't have to you don't have to know how to sing you know so that got me open grandmaster flash and the furious five melly mail the message is what got me all the way open okay you know what i'm saying so once i heard that I was a fan. That didn't that didn't mean that's that's what I wanted to do for yeah. a living, but you know that was the it's called the message. Like you know what I'm saying? It's music and it's street and it's tough and dude is telling a story. Broken glass everywhere. Niggas pissing on the stairs and you know. Yeah. So it's talking that language too. Mm-hmm. So that's what that's what kind of opened me up. Gotcha. And then so what age were you when you first started? Write, writing your own rhymes and oh, uh, that had to be about 85, 86, 80, 1985, 86, and at the same time, that was around the time when dope crack, you know, crack, co- crack cocaine hit L.A. and Watts and Compton. Uh huh. So we was getting money. So Mixmaster Spade, uh, Toddy T, yep, Mixmaster Ken, the, the Mixmasters period, uh, Joe Cooley, Rodney O, yep. Easy E, like all of that hit at the same time. Yep. So the crack thing, the, the Compton and Watts thing, Mixmaster Spade was doing mixtapes, hood tape. He was doing hood tapes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so that opened me up a different kind of way because we wasn't trying to be rappers, but the soundtrack, we just was on that hood shit. Like this dude is speaking our language. This yeah. is not Run DMC and 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 Melly Mel and over there on the East Coast, these dudes is talking about what we doing every day and, and Watts and Compton. It didn't have to be fly and fresh. It was just it was just what we was doing. They was talking about what we was doing in our in our West Coast hood lifestyle or whatever. So that again blew the top off off the whole situation. You know what I'm saying? So and and seeing them start getting money from it and, and, and you know Dudos and Skateland and you know Dr. Dre and the Wrecking Crew and you know I was going to Centennial. I got kicked out of Centennial and then I was going to Lock High School and then I wound up my senior year going back to Centennial. Yeah. So all of that was was prime time, you know, stuff that was going on. So NWA Cube, all of that, like we we seen all of that. We yeah. seen Easy E. I used to go to the swap me. I wasn't even trying to rap like that, but I seen them actually turning that into a buzz. And before it was social media and everything, we 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 was knowing they records. Yeah. And we had 1580K Day with Greg Mack and all that. It was AM before it was FM. Yeah. So that's what really you know also help open me up like we can we can really do this like we can do this this is something that i know that nigga right they, they, they go do right there yeah you know what i'm saying so it, it was tangible it was touchable like if he can do it then i can do it so that's kind of you know what what really blew it off the, the the top the top off of it for me and say I'm, I'm gonna actually try to do this did you know any of the guys from nwa i didn't know them then but i used to always see them or whatever and they was hands-on like you can reach out and touch them and Talk, yeah. because they wasn't they wasn't known like that. It, yeah. was, it wasn't a big thing like that. Yeah. So easy and Ren and all them like they'd be at the Compton swap meet. We be at the they trying to sell tapes. They sitting right there in a little minivan trying to sell tapes out there. And you know, oh yeah, yeah, I heard your shit. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't even like that kind of. It wasn't no such thing as stars and stardom and nothing like that. They was right there at the swap meet. They was in Compton. They was in the street trying to literally sell you their tapes. 
Yeah. And you you bumping they tapes like, oh, this the new one? Yeah. yeah, and I'm shouting out Kelly Park and I'm shouting out Grape and I'm shouting out like it was it was that kind of thing. Like, yeah. oh, okay, I got that one. So you ride back through through our hood, like nigga, I got the latest spade tape. Like he, he giving the homies a shout out, you know. Yeah. That's how that's how it was. And that and that's really the formula that all of these rappers, independent rappers, wind up using, which is sew up your local community, have your community behind you. Do tapes and and and, and Raps for your 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 local homies, and then that's gonna spread. That's gonna create a buzz or whatever. Don't worry about trying to go international and trying to go global. No, just sew up your town. Yeah. Sew up your town. Get your town behind you, and that still applies to this day. Get yeah. your town behind you, and then that's gonna grow legs, and mo- they're gonna be talking about you. All it takes is one or two or three influential people from your hood. That's gonna that's gonna affect something outside your hood or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And the rest is history. So you um, you start you, you basically are friends with DJ Pooh. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. I became friends with DJ Pooh through doing what I'm saying, doing right now. Yeah. Because before I was in the nation and all of that, uh, I met DJ Pooh because me and my my homie that I grew up with, Wood Elwood from my neighborhood, uh-huh. and my sister, rest in peace, Levon, um, encouraged us to 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 enter a St. Ives beer rap contest. That's uh-huh. when St. Ives first started. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Cam got on from a St. Ives, <laughs> St. Ives rap contest. Okay. I didn't so know I that. won, yeah, I won, me and my homie Wood won first place on the St. Ives rap contest. You know, of course I ain't rapped about no beer or no vices since. Yeah. But that was the time frame. I'm fresh out of high school. And my sister said, "You need to do it to this song right here." It was like King Floyd, Pink, uh, yeah, King Floyd, some song. And she the one told me you should sample this song right here. And me and my homie Wood, you know, did the rap to it. So that's how I met Pooh because Pooh was one of the judges. Oh, okay. This was Saint Eyes Beer first was coming out. Yeah, you know and, what I'm saying. And Cube was, uh, no, was this way before this Cube. This is before Cube. This is way before oh, Cube. Okay. This is when it first was coming out. First coming out. Yeah, this is '89. Okay. It's like '89. And yeah. so, 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 Pooh is one of the the contest the judges. Uh, yeah. judge. he's, the, he's the judge of this hip hop. So, Minot or whoever that I forgot his first, but his name was Minot. I forgot his last name. He was the the executive over Saint Eyes. Uh-huh. They they put Pooh in charge of judging that because they was trying to win the urban um, community to you know to, to buy yeah. into Saint Eyes and start becoming consumers and all that. They knew they needed hip hop and rap to, yeah. to do it. So we winded up, me and my homie Wood winded up winning that contest, but it was some politics involved that I ain't gonna go into <laughs> because one of the other dudes who, who was one of the executives, he wanted his his little people to win. So, uh, so but but Pooh, you know, he he let us know that re- y'all really won, man, and shit, shit, y'all shit was fly. So that's when me and Pooh became friends from that. Okay, he, gotcha. Know, so from from then on, he's like, I'm, I'm kind of dealing with Cube and this and that, and my homie Solo mm-hmm. from uh, 11 East East Coast. You know, he was he was dabbling with my homie, my big homie Jess and Mo Like from, from Watts, from Great. So, you know, we kind of just squatted up and knowing that people was kind of feeling us and that we had a little talent, so we was taking street money and putting it into that because the, the crack shit was popping, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So we was putting our money into that. So all of that winded up um, coalescing or whatever to to us all being at uh, Echo Sound in Los Feliz. Mm-hmm. That's where I really wind up sitting down with Q because me and my homies from from Eleven Eight and from Grape and all of that was was working on our own independent shit from some street money. Yeah, and Cube was in the stu- the studio next door. But Solo had been going back and forth with Cube, trying to prep him. Like I got somebody, like because they kind of knew each other off and on from just some some some, some street stuff or whatever. Yeah. So it just happened that we 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 all happened to be at the same place at the same time doing some work. We was in Studio A and he was in Studio B. He came over and was listening to what you know what we had and you know hollering at Solo and shit. So at that time he was like man i'm 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 just i'm going solo right now i'm working on this kill at will ep i got this artist named yo yo i got the lynch mob or whatever man i want to i want to mess with you mm-hmm. so that's how the relationship with cube started you know so, so at this time 
he had left NWA. Yeah. And and the beef, the beef are you know kind of or or it, it, it didn't start yet. No, it wasn't yet. It, it wasn't, wasn't yet. He was just fresh off the Kill It Wheel when he went to Hank Shockley like the Bomb Squad in New yeah. York and did the yep. Kill It Wheel thing. It wasn't beef yet, really. Okay. The so, beef didn't start until once I got on there. Like, so Cam came in there shaking things I, no, up. No, I didn't start the beef, but I, I supported the beef. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so you meet you meet Ice Cube, um, legendary guy. Yeah, and and I'm sure at this time he's just he he's probably worldwide known by now. Uh, um, he, he he's. Internationally, internationally. I mean, not internet, yeah. but he's nationally, nationally known, not known. internationally. He's, this is a national. This is before he still he ain't blew up like that yet. So, um, and then the 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 beef starts happening between him and NWA, yeah. and then you come on the scene solo. Yeah. And uh, now, were you part of the Lynch Mob? Or, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah. you part yeah, of the Lynch Mob? I was the main mob. character of the Lynch Mob, but it was it's like the Dog Pound. Yeah. I wasn't part of the group, the rap group called the Lynch Mob because yeah. I was already independent artist. I was already artist, but over the you know the the the, the click called the Lynch Mob. The group, you know. I was I was a, a key player of the lynch mob, you know what I'm saying? But the actual lynch mob is JD, uh Free JD, shouts out to him. Yeah. Um Shorty, get well, you know, he's he's dealing with a lot of, some, some some serious health issues right now, so you know, shouts out and prayers for Shorty and T-Bone. So they was that that was the lynch mob. Yeah. Shouts out to Mr. Woody that was you yeah, know, and Chili Chili Chills, the producers or whatever, so not whatever, but but um, that was the rap group part, like the Dog Pound, you know. Mm -hmm. you, but Dog Pound also was a clique of of homies that wasn't rapping. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So that's how that 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 kind of went. And they didn't really have beef with Q until he was successful going solo. Okay, that's where the beef kind of came in because he left NWA to do his own thing. Yeah, and then blew up and got successful. Like the shit was fly. That Kill Kill at Will was was fly and went platinum. Yeah, without Dre, without Easy, without Ren. You know what I'm saying? So that's where that their thing came in at. Uh -huh. So at the same time, he you know he was allying with us. So oh no, we got we got you, bro. Like you know what yeah. I'm saying? Oh yeah, we got you. You know what I'm saying? Don't worry about that part. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Do, do, do you think like you guys gave validity to Ice Cube at the time? Um, well, yeah, of course. But he gave validity to me. Yeah, like he 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 validated me in the music shit. I, we validated him in the street in the, on the street side. So yeah. it was a mutual thing. You know what I'm saying? Not saying that he wasn't a street dude or whatever. Yeah. I'm not saying that. I don't know what his pedigree was in the street, but I know what ours was. Solo is giving yeah. your stuff to Cube, mm -hmm. and. Now you guys are ready for your first album, Never Again. Talk about that album. Yeah, Never Again. Like my my, like Cube knew my um, my style or my theme or my image. At that point, was kind of like NOI based. He knew I was freshly a member of the Nation of Islam, and it's a military, it's an army, or whatever. But he knew I was from these these LA East Side streets. So it was a good, I was a good ally for him, just like he was a great ally for me in this, in this music thing. I never really questioned whatever his, his hood, I know he was from 111 and he had some, some 111s, you know what I'm saying, um, backing him up. But I never really got into that because my thing was more, at that, at that time, I had went through so much, um, Real, any like recognizing how the, the real enemy, this white supremacist system, was was on me, and I already had physically did certain things to me. I'd already got abused and and did you know got got charged with with attempted murder on the police and all of that, and like you know, and I had to you know I was in, in jail under the alias and all of that, and you know Celeste King back back in the day, you know rest in peace, bailed me out, but I still was under. So it, it, you know, it's, it was a lot of stuff that I, I can't really talk about even right now. But that's what that's what led me to to take a certain position that I that I took. <clears throat> Cube recognized that you know I, I was I would be a, a 
intelligent ally. Like I wasn't reckless or nothing like that. I was intelligent. I'm really from where I'm from and all of that, but I was on a different page. I wasn't on no blood and crypt page at that point. Yeah. I was on a real enemy because a real enemy had violated me, you know what I'm saying? So I was keyed in on that, you know what I'm saying? So, and I know I, I couldn't outgun him, you know? So I was learning, like my older brother, Ruben Muhammad, like he was going to USC, he was in the Navy, he was in the military. He the one turned me on to this whole Nation of Islam stuff in the first place because he was in the Navy and then they gave him a scholarship to USC and, it, and, and while he was going to USC, some brothers used to visit the campus and going to the Black Student Union and give, tapes and selling tapes and, 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 and uh, papers or whatever. That's what actually kind of woke me up to certain concepts. I already was thinking of thinking that, you know, it, you know, seeing certain things going on in society, but once he, he you know, he, he got in, involved, he used to bring tapes of Minister Farrakhan home. And since it was like three generations of us is like eight people in one house. So if he playing a DVD, I had to hear it. Like I was like, man, I'll turn that shit off. I don't wanna hear that shit. Like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? But it was drilling on me while I was trying to sleep and it made a whole lot of sense. And he's my big brother, so I love him. But even though he wasn't on, on the street thing real tough, he was more on an academic, you know, USC, Navy, you know what I'm saying? But so he, I respected his intellect, his, his academic intellect. So. By him being on that and, and, and the tapes he was listening to every day for whatever reason he was listening to it, he was turning it up and drilling and me and him we used to get in, you know, arguments. I'm like, yeah. turn that shit down, man. I don't wanna hear that shit. I don't wanna hear that you know. But it was it was real shit. Like it was it was seeking through and leaking through and all of that. So it it was getting to me. Um so once I started, you know, I, I continued doing my little stupid stuff in the street and started running into life-threatening situations and, and problems or whatever. Um, my brother would be the only one that was there for me. And I, even though I didn't agree with whatever he in this Muslim stuff and all of that, but he, he'd he be always like, he'd be like, where your, where your, where your homies at now? You yeah. know what I'm saying? You, you in the hospital, are you here, are you there? Like, you know, and he would be the one there for me. Yep. So I was like, man, you know, one particular situation, man, if your Allah get me out of this, you know, I'll be with it. I, 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 I'll be with you on it. You know what I'm saying? And it didn't happen overnight, but his his Allah got me out of it, and I've been I've been keeping my word ever since. You know what I'm saying? So that was the the backdrop of me getting introduced to Q. All right, so let's talk about never again. Never again. It'll never happen again. <laughs> never again. So, uh, so you go in, do the album. Yeah. Um, was that 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 was your first album? Yeah, that was my first album under under Ice Cube's production called Street Knowledge Productions. Once we once we got together and did our first deal, um, it was under Street Knowledge Productions through East West Atlantic. Um, so. Q, I had a production deal with, with Ice Cube and you know he went and got a, a distribution deal through Atlantic for three acts. One was Cam, one was Lynch Mob, and one was Yo-Yo. So, you know, he got a little bread for that. And at that time, you know, we we, we, we a deal was like three hundred thousand per act. You know, hundred for your pocket, hundred for album production, and hundred for marketing and promotion. So each act basically was 300 a piece, 300 for Cam, 300 for Yo-Yo, 300 for the Lynch Mob. So, and by him being Q, like he, he, you know, he can get one point something, he can get one and a half mil for it. So he gonna put, put that, that extra in his pocket and that's, that's a good deal. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You Q, you know what I'm saying? You was able to go get that more than we would have been able to get for ourselves. So that was an understanding. So that's, that's how that business relationship started. So. The, Never Again album that came out in 1993. The first single was um, Peace Treaty. That was um, dealing with the, the gang truce following the, the Rodney King verdict in the uprising in, in 92. Yeah, so I wrote it before that even happened, but because of the record industry, you know, it take months or whatever before they get marketed and set up. So by the time um, the record came out, Actual, the actual our actual riot happened, you know what I'm saying? The actual yeah. gang truce happened, so I kind of updated some lyrics, you know, 
uh, that 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 was like past tense, like like it had already happened. But I wrote that record and I wrote Watch Riot with Q before all that ever happened. Oh wow, wow. So like, and I was telling you early on, still got love for him. It's like one of my favorite. Yes. It's top ten. Yeah, it's mine too. So how like what inspires you to write a song like that? Because that was what I knew as a, just a. Uh, a ghetto child that didn't know that he was in hell. You thought, like I said, you know, I thought this hell was heaven. Like every day, just getting up and seeing the little s spiders and bugs and dew on the on the leaves or whatever. Like that was that was just like bomb. Like you didn't you didn't know it was racism. You didn't know it was poverty. You didn't know you was poor. You didn't know you was sick. You didn't know none of that. You just was appreciating all the things that you could possibly appreciate. Like a child is trying to appreciate, like they looking for reasons to laugh and smile and shit and have fun. That's what adults is supposed to do. But once so much bullshit gets in the game, you know, as adults, or you might be getting molested or raped or some Trump traumatic happened to you as a child, then that, that, that steers your, your thing in a, in a negative direction. You know what I'm saying? So you just trying to cope and survive the trauma that happened to you. So fortunately, I didn't have that kind of trauma. So my thing was just, I'm well, yet because my trauma came in the form of racist police abusing, you know, abusing me or whatever. But that that didn't happen yet, you know. So I was tapping in and tuning in to how I was thinking and feeling and living, how I looked at life before I was aware of of all of that. You know what I'm saying? So that was heaven to me, even though it was hell, even though we was slaves and products of this and that, we still was focusing on the, the, the natural, happy, pleasure moments of, of, of life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and even the, the deaths, like my little sister passed away when I was like nine years old, you know, that was traumatic, you know, and then you, you, you know, I seen other deaths of homies or whatever, but I didn't even process it like it was a horror movie and then it was sad and all that, but I still had faith in, in life, you know what I'm saying? I have faith in society or whatever until I learn later on, like, oh no, white supremacist society is not interested in your survival, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I had to adjust to that. It's like being born in uh, um, Iraq or Af Afghanistan or something. I, I, you know, I, I just want to be a child, but oh, it's war, I'm born in the middle of war, so I got to adjust to my mind, okay, I gotta, I gotta be able to murder somebody, or, or you know, what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's, that's how that went. So, so never again. And then your second album was Made in America. Yeah, made in America. That's when I already split from Cube at that point. Um, so, so let's back, let's let, let's back up there. So, so the first album, Never Again, tremendous. Some some great songs on there. Right. It gets, you know, people are loving it. I remember, um, you know. Uh, a peace treaty yeah, yeah. was out. Uh, yeah. uh, still got, got love for him, him was out, yeah. and and so so the success is coming. What what what, what triggers from there? Um, I mean that's you know, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but because it's not a theory, but once that started making that kind of noise and the stuff that I was specifically talking about and the affiliation that I was uh, obviously with, which was the Nation of Islam, that um, inspired and sparked a, a, a move you know, a movement to kind of silence me or, and separate me or kind of like infiltrate the, the, the bond that I had with, with Cube, with Ice Cube, and, you know, just, just the the influence that I had, period, at that time. So without going into no details, COINTELPRO is real mm -hmm. in, 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 in this day and time. So the same thing that J. Edgar Hoover was doing with Malcolm X against Elijah Muhammad and Martin Luther King against his wife, like, you know, and this and that, those, those tactics is real, you know. So the unity that was being displayed at that time and the demonstration that we was, we was on at that time scared a lot of people. It scared a lot of powerful people, American, white American people. You know what I'm saying? So they control the money, they control the fame and the media outlets and all that. So they went to work using their their outlets to to disrupt or or cause uh, 
destabilizations of, of personal relationships. So that's what I go into the detail. That's what happened between me and Cube. It was, infiltra it was infiltrators within the nation of Islam, my, my organization, and of course in the music industry and other places like that's that's in his ear about this and it, you know. So. So so what was the incident, or what was the specific thing that kind of drove the wedge between you and Cube? It wasn't one incident. It wasn't really one incident. It was a combination. It was a buildup of certain things. And um, he wasn't, it, it wasn't even, like I said, it was, a, it was just a combination. It was just misunderstanding, miscommunications, as, as well as infiltrations and shit like that. Um, he didn't sign up for what I signed up for, and I didn't sign up for what he signed. I, I respected what he was about and what he was doing, you know, because he's a music guy, you know, at this point. So his, you know, his priority was music and, and, and taking over the industry and, and becoming financially independent and, and strong and, you know, and has had a leverage. That wasn't my place. My place was more like Muhammad Ali, like I'm, I'm willing to blow up my career. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I got this platform, I'm going to speak and I'm going to ride for the people, I'm going to be the people's champ and I can go broke, I can die in the process. That wasn't necessarily his, his program, but we was working it out together like we take the the best of his his program and the best of my program was and was making it but the enemy can see that and and, and drive a wedge be, between that and, and kind of like exacerbate you know you know fan the flames or something that we so that's that's kind of like how that went you know i love the brother i love dude like you know q um i'm i'm a matured guy you know we got disagreements for sure we got mis you know but overall I, I learned a whole lot from him. It's like he learned a whole lot from me. I, he's not my enemy. Yeah. Even though I, I shoot shots at him, and I, tell, I shoot shots at Snoop, I shoot shots at Too Short, I shoot shots at Sugar Free, I shoot shots, but that's out of love because like we we know you, you know who the enemy, you know you know you you corrupting us, nigga. Like you know what I'm saying, you know what you're doing. Yeah. But he they know I love him. You know yeah. what I'm saying. And, and and what they doing ain't nothing compared to what the real enemy is doing. Yeah. But I, I just gotta keep shooting that shot. I gotta keep putting that pressure, you know what I'm saying? Until I'm until I'm gone. But I'm not they judge or condemning them. I, I love them dudes, you know what I'm saying? Have, have you talked to Cube like lately? I talked to him when I was making a, a mute, my mutual respect, my last album, a black and brown unity album called Mutual Respect. Yeah. He was supposed to be on that. Um he didn't he didn't get on it for uh, the reason that he said like he wasn't feeling the tracks because I was sending him certain tracks and he wasn't feeling them and then I was under a certain time constraint like I was trying to hurry up and meet this deadline so he wasn't feeling the track but I, I'm not going to wait for you to feel the track you know what I'm saying Yeah. so whatever you know and at the same time I even mentioned this on another interview show um, out of nowhere I got a $853,000 judgment from some sample shit you know that that was care of Cam through street knowledge, through his through his thing. So I told him, like, man, you know, the devil is busy, man. You know, obviously we being monitored because as we talk, I ain't talked to you, but now I get in the mail, I get uh, 800, almost a million dollar judgment against me, care of street knowledge, care of your label. They saying I owe almost a million dollars because of some samples, you know, that didn't get cleared. And I'm not a producer, so, and he was like, yeah, man, and, you know, well, he, he didn't respond to that because I'm sure his lawyers were saying don't even acknowledge that because if you acknowledge it, then, you know, he could say that you, you was aware. So I, I never heard nothing from him after that, and I never even pursued it or nothing like that. But that's still some business that we <laughs> we got to talk about. Wow, so is that still hanging out oh, there? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, wow. They've been garnishing all my ass caps and my, my publishing and all of that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and wow. I'm not a producer, so how did I get stuck with 853000 thousand dollar judgment yeah. for a sample when I'm not a producer. Wow. And he, he's got the means to to take care of that. You know? I man, I you know I, <laughs> man. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I I I wonder sometimes about and I guess, you know, I'm not there and and but these dudes that make you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. I mean, yeah. let, let's face it, like, and, and be honest, like, I bet you Cube's got more money than he could even go through in his lifetime. So, 
you know, to make things right or to, to you know, guys that helped him. Because, look, like, you know, like in my opinion, you guys kind of was like – validating him after the NWA stuff and and um and it's it's a shame that you know here here's a guy who you know he's he's got his own bat oh is it three on three basket uh, uh um I forgot what it's called yeah. the big the ba- the big three yeah the big three multiple endorsements movie deals actor not reach out to you be, you know because of an eight hundred and fifty three thousand yeah. dollar, you know, because I I'm sure you you know you would respect it more. He would say he would call you like, hey, I you know I don't know, you know, yeah. l- let me get my lawyers to represent you so you don't have to pay five hundred dollars an hour. Right, right. Those but, types of things. Yeah, I, I think it's a lawyer issue though. Oh, uh, okay. I think that's where the real enemies is at because it, you know at that level you know. Your lawyers are the one that stuck me with that deal. They the one stuck me with the with the check in the first place. Like you know, waiter, check plate. Like you know, everybody ate and they stuck me with the bill. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So that was a lawyer move, off out the rip. That wasn't a cube move necessarily. Mm-hmm. Cube ain't a lawyer. You know what I'm saying. He just got some some shark lawyers that that been working for him. So we'll stick that. We'll stick to that nigga. The nigga's gonna pay for it. The movie's gonna pay for it. Like you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so. I w- I won't blame that on Q, but once I make it uh, make him aware of it, then I'm I'm gonna wait and see what you how you respond. Yeah. And based on how you respond or you don't respond, then I'm gonna deal with you according to that. So that's that's all that's that. But I don't I don't blame him for that. But you know, I, I, you you was aware of it. But his lawyers, because if you a hundred and something, a couple of hundred million strong, your lawyers is gonna tell you don't respond. Yeah. That's like the Godfather. Okay, K, if if I accept this letter from you, that's gonna indicate you know that's suggest that i know your whereabouts so th- they saying don't even respond and i understand that part of the game you you worth that much i understand that so okay well that's that world i'm from a different world i'm from yeah. a, a street world and a spiritual world and, a, and a, the forces of universal forces of nature world so i i can wait if you can wait you know what i'm saying we'll see, we'll see how it turns out in the end so let's talk about your, your the first diss song the disses. Um, the the disses. <laughs> yeah, that's what used to make rap so good, man. Yeah, like, man. you know, the diss tracks and reading <laughs> the subliminals in there. I mean, right. so uh, let's talk about the first one. Uh, pull your pull your whole, whole yeah, card. Pull your whole card. Pull your whole card was just a response, actually, to a mixtape. Because me and, me and Cube were shooting shots at each other on, on some mixtapes. And uh, he had did a... Um, a mixtape on crazy on crazy tunes rest in peace crazy tune um where he was kind of clapping back on me about pull your whole car got one up your sleeve or something like that so we were shooting those shots back and forth and that is just some some immature ego piss contest you know what i'm saying so after he responded to the to the pull your whole car with with the mixtape the crazy tune mixtape that's what made me go to the lab and do the the whoop 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 Man is just a, uh, it was really a response to me being offended about the West Side Connection. Because myself, prior to that, myself, my cousin D Dog from uh, 11 8 and um, Red Rum from, from Inglewood, we had a group called the Universal Soldiers. It was Blood, Crip, and Black. You know what I'm saying? I was the black, you know, he was the red, and my cousin was the blue. Same image and all that that Mac-10, Dub C, and Cube did, right? So that along with, you know, the, the, the disagreements or whatever that I had with Cube, and me and Mac-10 was, was cool. Like, you know, Mac-10 was, you know, trying to get on at that time, and Cube was kind of playing him a certain kind of way. You know, and he kind of expressed his his dissatisfaction with that. And I was like, I got you, man. I got a song I'm doing called "Pull Your Whole Card," and then after that, I'm, you know, I got you, Mac. I'm 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 messing with you. So after that, uh, for whatever reason, maybe Cube got wind of it or whatever. So he winded up putting Mac on heavy and, and doing a group group with him and this and that. So I was I wasn't feeling that, and you know I told Mac like nigga you you know you told you told oh boy such and such and such and you know he, we ran into each other in traffic. He's like nigga I ain't tell that nigga that like you know what I'm saying this and that you know so he kept, he kept it one hundred, 
but still I wasn't feeling it. You know what I'm saying? So since you, you know, y'all niggas stole my little thing, I'm finna steal this woo woo. I know that's a blood thing, but yeah. you know, it's not against the bloods. This is against y'all. Like I'm, I'm, I'm shooting shots at y'all. That's yeah. why I'm saying. Was he the only one dissing or y'all were too? We can all go head up on pay-per-view. Like, this was against that group. This wasn't against the Bloods that really was whooping. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a personal shot. You know what I'm saying? Because I knew, you know, he was on that page on that. So, but after that, you know, me and Mac and Solo, you know, we was we was hooking up. And that's what, <laughs> after that, that chain, that you know, that W chain incident and all of that. And um, yeah, I ain't gonna go into to that really, but because we was we was all kind of like laughing about it, like you know what I'm saying. You talking about the incident where Solo knocked yeah, him me out? Me Solo and Mac, like you know, because because Mac was like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get the chain back, you know, get his dude his chain back, and you know, and, and we like nah, you know what I'm saying, nah, because it's principles involved. But we was all we was all laughing about it. It, it wasn't that it was an anti cube thing, like, but Mac was like, y'all niggas crazy, y'all he's our niggas crazy. I was like, nigga, y'all niggas crazy, nigga, y'all, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was respect like that, and we 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 didn't we weren't stepping on his politics and his uh, his loyalty to Cube and all that. Like, nah, it just is what it is, nigga. Like, you know what I'm saying? You know, I got more history with Cube than you do, nigga. Like, you know what I'm saying? It, it, we you know so. It, it was, it was just that kind of thing. It was a sticky, tricky little situation or whatever and shit. But um, it wasn't until Minister Farrakhan and, you know, and Mustafa, his son, sat me down and told me, you know, t- you know, uh, a stand down. You know what I'm saying? Then, okay, well, I'm out of it. And then we, we, we made up after that. Like, we went to Minister Farrakhan's house. Me, Cube, Shorty, you know, Fat Joe, a few people. Like, it was a, it was a piece of something. It was a squashing you know, and we made some promises or what you know, I kept my I kept my promises, but he didn't really keep his, you know, according to what was said. So but we just left it like that. But I, my promise wasn't to him. My promise was to my leader, my, you know, my my chief, my my uh, commander in chief, which is Minister Farrakhan. So I told him I wouldn't I wouldn't continue to do this against dude. And, and that's that's how that stopped. He stopped it. Do you, do, you, do you feel like your affiliation with the NOI has hurt your career? <laughs> yeah, it hurt my music career. It didn't hurt yeah. my manhood career. No, <laughs> your, 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 I'm sorry, your music career. Yeah, my yeah my music career. But my music career is ran by suckers anyway. Yeah, it's ran by you know, not no disrespect, but it's ran by. Um, Immoral weaklings, I just say that. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so that's not what I'm trying to impress. I'm not trying to be that. I'm trying to represent the struggle of a, a people that have been enslaved for 400 years and, and oppressed for 464 years. I don't care about who runs the industry. Yeah. So, of course, yeah, okay, whatever. That's like Malcolm X or Marcus Garvey or anybody. They, you know, they, yeah. J. Edgar Hoover, yeah, they gonna be against you. Muhammad Ali, yeah, they yeah, against me. All right, you not you not ruining my my testicle career. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you, you know, today, like, um, like, well, what's your what's your, what's your feelings on hip hop today? Hip hop today has been hijacked and conquered, you know, by the people that write the checks, by those weak moral characters who run the industry, who own these labels and own these radio stations. So it don't mean that that's what hip hop is conquered, but mainstream commercial hip hop is definitely conquered. But fortunately, we got the Internet. Fortunately, we got social media. So you can still put out real raw, you know, messages and, and, and prolific and thought provoking stuff. And you don't have to be at the mercy of what these labels want to do with it or what they don't want to do with it. Some A and R that ain't never lived the life. They ain't never struggled, never suffered, nothing, never been in the hood. So you gotta make your choice today. It's like a value of decision. Do I wanna go for the bag, this mainstream commercial bag, or do I wanna do it the old fashioned way, you know what I'm saying, the home cooked meal way, and it's gonna take way longer, but it's gonna be more satisfying and healthy once you get it. Yeah. So that's that's what it is. The immediate bag or the the home cook, you know, healthy bag that's gonna take way longer and way more effort to to cook to cook up. McDonald's or home cooking? Yeah, that's that's really what McDonald's gonna feed you right now, but it's gonna get you sick. Yeah, home cooking and shit is gonna take a long time, but it's gonna it's gonna be healthy for you. It's gonna last, you know. So that's that's the career 
choices of of people that's trying to do hip hop today. Yeah. Um. Are, 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 so so what's for what, what's Cam in the future? Cam in the future. I got a. I'm I'm doing books. I'm an author now. Okay. You know, I'm writing movies too, but I'm I'm an author. I just finished my first book I ever wrote, and it's a relationship book, and it's called War in Your Heaven. It's talking about the the black man's relationship problems with his black woman today and the feared solutions. Because before you can even get to rap and money and the bag and all of that, everything, your real wealth is your family. Yeah. Your real wealth is what's going on in your household, your children, your wife, your woman, your bedroom, you know what I'm saying? Because success and all that, you know, like in, in, in some old school movie, Mahogany with Billy D. Williams and, and Diana Ross, success ain't nothing if you ain't got somebody that you love to share with. If you ain't got no family to share this so-called success and bag and fame and all that with, you you an empty person. You a, sh- a, a, a shell. You a hollow person. You're not fulfilling your real purpose. You know what I'm saying? And we learn that in the ghetto. We got real love when we poor. We It's five people in one pissy mattress bed and shit. You know, we poor. We don't got no money, but we got each other. Yeah. You don't think that's the real wealth until you get out here and really taste this other shit that's supposed to be luxury and that's supposed to be high class and high end and celebrity fame and stardom and all of that. That shit is bullshit. I'm telling you what I know. I know all these top celebrities, they be miserable. Yeah. They don't got no character, you know what I'm saying? Because they believing in the bag, they believing in the fame. They wishing that they wasn't fame. They wish they can go back to just having that real love because once you got money and fame like that, you don't know who with you for what. You don't, you're not with me because you really love me. Yeah. You with me for this bag, you with me for this fame. So I learned that through this whole thing that the real wealth is your family. Yeah. A loving family. Yeah. Period. It's all said and done. When you you taking your last breath, it don't care, it don't matter how much money you accumulate, that money ain't finna you ain't gonna hold that money hand in, you know, on your on your last breath. You want your family there. You want somebody that loves you that's there. Yeah. Yeah. Because we all gotta check out like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So if you got money but no family, you poor as a motherfucker. Yeah. But if you got family and no money, you you might be the richest man on earth. So don't ever sacrifice your family for the bag. Don't ever put your family on the back burner chasing some fucking bag. Don't ever do that. Ever do that. Stay poor. Just die poor with a loving family. Just be poor if if that's what you got to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well... uh I want to talk about your brother real quick, mm-hmm. Young Bruh. Yeah, yeah, Young Bruh. Young Bruh. How, how did Young Bruh get his? How, how did he get his name, Young Bruh? Because because that that actually came from the the Quran and the Bible. Because I, I kind of like represent. I saw myself early on as Joseph in the Bible and the Quran. You know, and it, and his brothers sold him out. You know, what I'm saying they saw his potential, or whatever, and they they sold him out. And he went through a whole lot of persecution by his own brothers, his, the envy of his own brothers, because he had a certain gifts and talent and he was able to see and interpret visions and dreams and shit like that. And he also, out of his all, all of his brothers, it was another, his, his younger brother, his young, young brother, you know what I'm saying, had a, a similar gift. But the rest of his brothers didn't re- really have that gift. So my little brother, Marcus, you know what I'm saying, I, I gave him that name, Young Bruh. Because he represented like, the, and the young brother of of Joseph' name was Benjamin. Uh-huh. So I gave him that rap name because I recognized that in him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he got the name Young Bro strictly from you know me understanding something about the Bible and the Quran and like this is this is my young bro right here. He fulfills that like he's coming up in that same lane. He ain't suffering exactly what I suffer, yeah. but he's suffering because he's seen me suffer. He's seen what I went through with Cube and all these the industry and the, the enemies and all of that. Yeah, and. He, his his warrior spirit came up. He wanted to fight for his brother. I'm like, no, 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 you, you'll get your chance. Yeah. So I, I gave him the name Young, bro, because I recognize him as, as Joseph, you know, that was being persecuted by his own people, his own brothers, and, and sold out. You know what I'm saying? You, you're going to come up behind me and, and, and do what I wasn't able to do. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what, that's what that came I, I was I, I was telling uh, I was telling why, like, um, I was talking to him one day, and I was flipping through the gram, and I saw this song, and it was it, it, it was like yeah, it's, I was catchy. Fine, it was uh, it was uh, Fear of a Black Fist, yeah, yeah. and, and I, I watched the video. I'm like, man, this is dope. 
and uh, and then I, I was, and Big Y was like, "Man, I'm in that video. Yeah, that's, in that one. He's yeah. main, main feature." Today. And he's like, uh, "That's my little homie. That's yeah. Cam's brother." I go, yeah. "Really?" Yeah. And uh, so, anybody watching this show, I definitely go check out Young Bruh, Fear of check a Black Fist, uh, and yeah. go out there and support support him. But um, yeah, I, I saw that man. I'm like, Shh, man, that that is yeah. dope. That yeah, is dope. dope. It's dope. And once again, like I told you earlier, you know, as as a, as as I close my conclusion, like I'm a member of the, me and Young Bro, members of the Nation of Islam. You know, down there 30 years for myself. And for all of the people that be claiming and trying to throw that propaganda out there, like they hate white people and all of that, the Prophet of Islam. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, of, of Arabia, we in the Nation of Islam understand and know and understand and embrace him. He was a white man. He was a white Arab. So, and, and the man that we recognize as Mahdi, or the savior that taught Elijah Muhammad, he was half original. His mother was a pure white woman from the Caucasus mountain region, and his father was a, a black Arab. And he was made of two people, those two extreme people, black and white, so he can give justice to both of them. Yeah. So it's not no hate white people. We hate devil. You should hate. Every, everybody should hate evil. <laughs> yeah. Everybody should hate devil. Yeah, yeah. But my, my nephews and, and family members is, is, is lighter than white people. Their skin is whiter than white people. You know what I'm saying? So it's not about the color of nobody's skin. We proved for 400 years that we don't got no problem worshiping and loving white Jesus or white people. We worship white people. But it's time to wor worship right people, not white people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I just wanted to put that out there because, you know, like I said, Prophet Muhammad, that's why they got a problem in white America and a lot of in, in, in Europe and all that got a problem with Islam because they know that the prophet of Islam was white. And he eliminates all their excuses. You know, he, he proves that white people can fight the weakness of their own nature and become holy, but they don't want to do that war. A lot of them don't want to do that war. Only the, through hip hop, white people that, that grew up with black people and understand that oh, there ain't no racism, they way closer to being holy than these so-called holy, righteous, political white people. You know what I'm saying? Racism exists, you know what I'm saying? That shit is real. But from my personal experience, the best of white people is the ones that's among us in this street shit, in this hip hop street shit. You know what I'm saying? So, call it what you want to call it, but it's going to prove to be true. Well, no, man, we appreciate you, man. We appreciate you coming out here, and uh, we know you had a long drive, man. And yeah. uh, and thanks for bearing with me with this coffin. Oh, no, and, you know, it, um, it, and we'll close out. But, again, thank you, Cam. And thank you, anything, you, anything you want uh, the viewers to check out, any of your books? Uh, um, like I said, War in Your Heaven is coming out this March. War in Your Heaven is a relationship book, and I'm giving up bars for for my brothers that ain't able to really defend themselves. I'm the Johnny Cochran of relationships for y'all, <laughs> and y'all can y'all can you know follow me at warinyourheaven.com. That's the website for the book, and follow me on uh, all the social media, West Coast Cam at everything, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, you yeah. know, Twitter, West Coast Cam K A M. There you go, West Coast. This your brother Cam, and y'all are now tuned in to Urban City TV, West Coast Official. <laughs>